In the previous video, we talked about one of the types of cells in the nervous system, the neurons. In this video, we'll take up the other type of cells, the glial cells. We've known about glial cells now since the middle of the 19th century, but they've really been kind of the forgotten cells of the nervous system. A neuroglia just simply stands for nervous glue, and that's what we thought the glial cells did. They held things together and they supported the neurons, which were the business end of your brain. Turns out that we've uh, missed out on a lot that the glial cells do for quite a long time now. And over the past 20 years or so, we've really started to learn far more about the importance of the glial cells and what they do. The glial cells uh, are somewhat diverse, uh, and they have a variety of functions, including providing lactate and O2 to neurons. Neurons will then aerobically break down that lactate to get the ATP that they need for their biological work. And neuroglia also help to maintain homeostasis, and we'll see that there are a variety of ways that they do this. They provide electrical insulation to axons, and in the previous video we did look at myelinated axons, and that's the insulation that we're talking about here. Uh, glial cells also help to destroy pathogens, the, the immune representatives in the central nervous system. They help to regulate repair and also to remove dead neurons, and so when we have uh, injury to the brain, then the glial cells become important. They also help to control the chemical and the, and the ionic environment of the neurons. And it even turns out that they actually play a role in thought and cognition and memory, things like that. And so again, as I said, they've kind of been the forgotten cells of the nervous system. Here we see an oligodendrocyte. Uh, oligodendrocytes are the cells in the central nervous system that are responsible for myelinating the axons uh, of the neurons that we find up there. And again, just a reminder, when we see myelinated axons, they aren't entirely encased in myelin. There are these bare spots that are known as nodes of Ranvier, and these become very important when we talk about how a signal passes down an axon. The principal function of the oligodendrocytes is to produce the myelin sheath, uh, and it can insulate up to as many as 30 axons from different neurons. Uh, the myelin is composed uh, primarily of lipid and protein, and so it's approximately 70% lipid, most of that being phospholipid and cholesterol, which we've already talked about when we talked about cell membranes. And then about 30% of it would be protein. The, one of the interesting things is that the protein of the myelin in the central nervous system is actually different than the protein in myelin found in the peripheral nervous system. And this myelin is very important in that it allows for rapid conduction of an action potential along an axon. The action potential in an unmyelinated axon is conducted at about 2 miles per hour, uh, while in a myelinated axon it's conducted at about 200 miles per hour. And so you can see that it's very important for rapid signaling. Another interesting thing about the oligodendrocytes is that communication takes place between the oligodendrocyte and the axon when the axon is active. It's still unclear what the significance of that is, but there are a number of people who are researching it to try and understand better the importance of that. The analogous cell in the peripheral nervous system, which we already mentioned in the previous video, is the Schwann cell. And again, the Schwann cell wraps around and around and around the axon, giving us these layers, these concentric layers of myelin. Here you can see uh, a multipolar neuron, uh, which has a myelinated axon. And you can see, again, that it takes a number of Schwann cells to myelinate an entire axon. And as you look here, uh, this axon has one, two, three, four, five, six, and part of a seventh, and we're not even down to the end of the axon yet. And so it might take hundreds, perhaps even thousands of Schwann cells in order to myelinate an entire axon in the peripheral nervous system. The other thing that you'll notice is that uh, even in neurons where the axon is unmyelinated, the Schwann cell wraps around them and provides some protection, but not the same type of insulation. And so these are unmyelinated axons in which the action potential is going to move along much, much more slowly. But you can see that these 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 axons still are enclosed by the myelin sheath. The Schwann cell is known as a neural emocyte, uh, and it is, again, a supporting cell of the PNS. Another thing is that the Schwann cells can help with cleaning up debris in the peripheral nervous system. Uh, they also help to re-guide the growth of damaged axons. And so in the peripheral nervous system, your axons can regrow, uh, and that uh, is directed by these Schwann cells. That's a difference between axons in the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. In the central nervous system, the axons can't regrow, uh, and that is prevented from occurring by some of these glial cells. Uh, and there are a number of people who are researching that to try and understand how those glial cells interfere with the regrowth of axons in the central nervous system and looking to see if uh, we can't somehow prevent that from occurring so that we can then get damaged axons in the central nervous system to regrow. Um, we're going to talk about EPSPs, IPSPs, and integration a little bit later on. Uh, but again, here is where impulse conduction occurs. Here's the trigger zone. That's where the action potential is initially generated, uh, but then it gets conducted down the length of the axon until we reach the synaptic knobs. Another type of glial cell that we find in the central nervous system uh, would be astrocytes. Um, some data suggests that the astrocytes are the most abundant of all the glial cells. Uh, we may have to wait until we have more data to be sure that that really is true. Um, but it seems that there are anywhere from two to ten times more astrocytes than there are neurons. And that can vary from region to region of the brain. Uh, they do provide some physical and mechanical support to neurons. They also help to clean up debris within the brain itself. They help to control the chemical composition of the interstitial fluid. And one of the very important things that they do is they suck up excess potassium, and that helps to maintain the extracellular uh, fluid potassium concentration. Uh, and as a result, that also helps to maintain the resting membrane potential. I hope that you remember that uh, potassium is found primarily inside the cell, uh, but when we have action potentials occur, the potassium has to leave the cell. And so these astrocytes play an important role in that respect. Another thing that they do is they help to provide nourishment to the neurons. Uh, the astrocytes take up glucose from the um, capillaries running through the brain. Uh, they break it down in fast glycolysis to lactate and then shuttle it over to the neurons. The neurons then in the presence of O2 will break that down to CO2 and water uh, and use energy that's liberated to uh, generate more ATP. Another really interesting thing about astrocytes is that they actually can sense and release uh, neuro the neurotransmitter glutamate. Uh, and glutamate actually triggers action potentials in neurons. Studies suggest that astrocytes actually play an active role in brain function. Uh, they can influence and direct the activity of neurons. Uh, these diagrams actually give you a better depiction of how the capillaries are encased uh, in what are known as the pseudopods or the feet of astrocytes. And so here you can see in cross section how that capillary is surrounded by those pseudopods. And here you can see in these diagrams uh, that the capillaries are covered by these pseudopods of the astrocytes. And this helps to uh, partially create what's known as the blood-brain barrier, uh, which actually prevents some things from leaving the blood and getting into the brain. Uh, and that obviously is a protective mechanism. Uh, astrocytes also communicate with neurons and other astrocytes through what are referred to as calcium waves. Uh, and another thing that we know is that when we compare humans to lower mammals, we find in humans more astrocytes, and the astrocytes that we find in the cortex tend to be larger. And so it's clear that those astrocytes must be doing something that's very important uh, in the brain. Another type of glial cell that we find uh, would be microglia. Microglia, uh, at this point, we believe make up about 5 to 20 percent of all glial cells. Uh, and they change shape, uh, and so that makes it a bit harder for us to count them and be sure how many there are. In this figure, the glial cells are the cells in red, uh, and you can see that the shapes are pretty constant. This diagram shows you glial cells changing shape depending upon uh, what it is that they have to do, and when they become active and have to attack things, 
and phagocytize them, then you can see that the shape is actually changing and becoming different. These are the actual representatives of the immune system here in the brain, and they help to protect your brain from invading microorganisms. Uh, they do act as phagocytes. Uh, they destroy pathogens. They also contribute to cleaning up debris that we find in the central nervous system. And so you can see that more than one glial cell is uh, involved in that. In addition to that, they release cytotoxic substances, uh, hydrogen peroxide and nitric oxide. Uh, interestingly, nitric oxide is also a neurotransmitter, uh, and so it plays a cytotoxic role as well as a communication role. Uh, the microglia release cytokines. Cytokines are hormone-like substances that actually help to regulate all parts of immune system function. Uh, the microglia have also been found to release glutamate, which again is a neurotransmitter. Uh, and then lastly, the microglia release growth factors, which are going to stimulate the growth of uh, cells in the brain. Another important job of microglia is to prune away extra branches on developing neurons. And so initially, neurons have multiple branches, uh, and not all of them will be used. And so the ones that don't get used will get pruned away. Uh, the microglia stimulate the growth of axons and also migration. And so cells within the nervous system can move from place to place. They're not static or stationary. They can move around. So the microglia are critical for neuroplasticity. And again, you know that brains can change. And that's what we mean by plasticity. They're moldable. Uh, and so through hard work, you can change your brain. You can make it better. Uh, and the truth is that uh, you, in fact, will be smarter when you graduate than you are right now. Uh, and part of my role and part of one of my goals is to try and push you to change your brain and to become smarter. Microglia have uh, receptors for neurotransmitters, and they also have those protein ion channels. And again, we're still trying to understand exactly what the significance of that is uh, and what it means for the functioning of the microglia and your brain in general. Not everybody includes ependymal cells in the glial cells, but some do, and so we'll uh, talk about them here as well. Uh, ependymal cells are found in the choroid plexus, and they line the ventricles of the brain and also the spinal cord. Uh, many of them uh, actually have cilia on the surface of them, and it's the ependymal cells which are producing cerebral spinal fluid and also circulating it. Remember that the cilia will beat uh, and move fluid that sits on the surface of the cells. And so that's what these ependymal cells do. Uh, they both secrete and circulate cerebral spinal fluid. Here you can see a picture uh, of some of those ependymal cells, and you, you look very carefully, you can see those very fine hair-like cilia. And then here's a diagram just showing you uh, the, a drawing of some of those ependymal cells. Uh, they are epithelial-like cells, and so they look simple cuboidal. And again, they do have those cilia on the surface. And then the last type of glial cell that we have uh, is out in the peripheral nervous system. These are satellite glial cells. And here you can see that what they do is that they are uh, found here covering the surface of these cell bodies and the pseudo-unipolar cells found in the posterior root ganglia. And they supply nutrients to these neurons and also provide some structural support as well. In the autonomic ganglia, uh, it's believed that these act much like the blood-brain barrier in the central nervous system, but they may also influence synaptic transmission. Uh, here you can see another diagram showing these pseudo-unipodal bowler cells uh, and the cell bodies being covered uh, by these satellite cells. And so now we've talked about the two types of cells that we find in the nervous system, neurons and satellite cells. And in the next uh, set of videos, we'll start to talk more specifically about how neurons communicate with one another and how they communicate with uh, other cells, effector cells.